We're very happy, uh, we're very lucky to have Bob here. Uh, Bob uh, is a professor of uh, psychology and neurology at Berkeley and UCSF. He's looking for the equipment at UCSF. If you want to use it, he's collecting music companies. Um, so he get a prize if you get like five of them. I don't know, I don't think anyone succeeded. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's really one of the... Um, uh, <laughs> Luckily, he didn't do this in his job talk. <laughs> uh, I was, I was going to say grand, grand, grandfathers of his field, but I don't know if that makes it sound. Um, that's a insult. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he's, he's, uh, he's going to tell us today about the neurophysiology of cognition. Uh, so he really is one of the uh, first players in the world of using reason studies. Uh, intracranial recording of EED, but basically the leveraging of clinical populations. Bob was trained as a uh, neurologist uh, for uh, insights into brain function with an emphasis on the prefrontal cortex. Uh, he's also uh, in the, 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 the main textbook for, uh, uh, for, for prefrontal lobe function uh, is, uh, in, in my talk. So uh, he's going to tell us about uh, some of the things that uh, he's been working on, including, I think, some work that's currently in the lab. And, uh, yeah, Thank you. Thanks for organizing this. I think it's really, it looks like it's really a great set. We're here, hopefully, many more. So, we, uh, how many people are from out of the country here? Not too many, just four or five? Okay, let's see. But, but, what do you mean? Where are you from? Greece. Greece. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, originally? Originally. Yeah, originally. Um, Canada. Trump annexed, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Look, America has invaded Canada by my reckoning five times in 1754, 1776, 1812, 1837, and 1867, and you lost every time. So. <laughs> they went to Canada too at the same time. Um, America really invaded Canada. Yeah. Um, no, but they did Mexico there too, wasn't that the Spanish War? No, that, Mexico was later. Later, okay. All right. Well, okay, you're okay then. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the people from out of the country, I'm going to tell you where I'm from. Out of the country. What's that? She won Wimbledon eight times in a row and never lost a match. So she was a phenomenal. She was from Oakland. She was born in Oakland and then uh, went to Berkeley and then became internationally famous. Married, let's say, well, and then left her estate to form the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. So she's great. First All right. So, all right. So now you know about Jaws. You will see many of you who've seen the movie. A lot of people. Okay. So where did, where did this, it's a real story, right? Where did the Jaws tactic occur? Anybody? <laughs> so where did they set it? What images, where was it, what location was it set in? Long Island. The problem is it didn't happen in Long Island. It actually happened in New Jersey in 1916. There's a book about it called Close to Shore. It's an incredible book. He got nominated for a Pulitzer. And this teenage, eight foot, great white came up, killed somebody there. About three days later, killed somebody here in the surf. The entire eastern seaboard got paralyzed because people would all come here from Philly and New York to you know, do, the, do the summer gig. You could see these spectacular places. Um, anyway, paralysis, there's a shark. And then, it, about four days later, swam into this little creek right here and killed two more kids at the top of the creek in brackish water, which is like salt water edge, which made some people think it was a bull shark, but I think it was a great bite from the pictures. And that's what the last two kills were, right here. And that's where I'm from. 
<laughs> and the, the shark, actually right on this beach, two kids actually caught the shark in the dragnet. The beach side actually grew up playing on, and they beat it to death with oars. <laughs> That's the only story. Anyway, all right. So, back to I'm sorry? I said, how did they know they caught the right shark? Did they find the people in it? body parts in it. Okay. They, you should read the book. It's really, it's really pretty exciting. They, they then took the shark and crossed the first thing I was, gutted it, found foot, arm, various uh, body parts, and uh, most of that stuff. I didn't know that when they killed it. And my brother had his retirement party. I took the passages out of the book of where they were beating the shark to death and read them but replaced the kid who was actually beating the shark with my brother's name. So kind of a little family bonding. All right. So I am really interested in front low and executive control and it's a big spectrum of its function. A lot of bad things happen to your frontal lobe. Infiltrating tumors, strokes, bad frontal temporal dementia, post traumatic loss of your orbital frontal cortex, unfortunate, uh, I'd say, misadventures of the treatment of psychiatric disease with leucotomies for, for psychiatric disorders. You read in the books that they were all lobotomies. They really were, by very few were lobotomies. They would drill two burr holes here, and they drop a rod in, they put the current to it, and they burn all the connections. So basically, you effectively disconnected your frontal lobe. That's what happened for psychiatric disorders. Unfortunately, we see a, a fair amount of this. You see Davis Med Center seeing this for sure, right? These are bullet tracks through the brain, uh, either suicide or uh, bad stuff in the field, so to speak. Uh, or dysplasias, and this is a pretty prominent dysplasia here. That, that, that's a kind of dysplasia. Dysplasias, there's about 20 or 25 genetic forms now that have been identified, which is a lot considering it really wasn't identified as a clinical syndrome until 1979. And it is a very big cause of intractable epilepsy, which is what we're going to be talking about today. It's about epilepsy. Now, we know this, this case would probably not get intracranial monitoring. It's an obvious location. If there's a spike wave here, this person's probably going straight to surgery. But there are many people where you don't really see the dysplasia, even on a 3 mr And those are, those are some of the patients that would be involved in monitoring for epilepsy. The numbers are pretty straightforward. 1% of the worldwide population has epilepsy. That means in the United States, there's about 3.5 million people with epilepsy. That excludes kids with febrile seizures. Uh, this is uh, because they usually don't go on to have a uh, seizure disorder in adulthood. They can. That would increase the number even more. Of that 3.5 million, roughly 15% are, are medication refractory, which means they don't respond to meds. Now you're, bringing, now you're getting close to 400, 500,000 people. And the, the evidence based studies. Keep giving them another med, get them, uh, get them a detailed evaluation, epilepsy and surgery, clearly shows that surgery is a better <coughs> The numbers that they think should be done in the country every year is 15 to 20,000 cases. The numbers that are actually done is about 1,500 to 2,000, so it's severely underused at the moment. I think it won't be for, you know, the other thing is that in, in our experience, every, not in our, everybody's experience, let's say your kids start seasons at age five, six, or seven, they often will not be conceived, even, and they're still seizing, and they're poorly controlled. They may not be considered for surgery until they're 20 or 22. You know the average age of our patients, right? They're, I think it's 23 to 25, which means a lot of people had problems earlier, and I'm hoping you're gonna see an earlier move to if kids fail to Maybe we'll give them three meds. They really should be evaluated for, um, I think, for surgical treatment. Because having chronic long-term seizures is just not good. Okay, so. Okay,
a little bit about the frontal lobe. This is David Furrier, the uh, brilliant British neuropsychologist. He actually really had the first reports of where the calcium cortex was. And so he's a brilliant behaviorist, and he locked off the frontal lobe of what he considered his three smartest monkeys. Notice it's a little complicated because it's lateral, medial, and orbital. And he had a hard time saying specifically what the deficit was. So this is to really characterize what was wrong with the person, in this case, the monkey. And this extended to the human literature. These are, this is Hans Lloyd Toybert, a brilliant anatomist. He referred to the frontal as a riddle. Luria, the great uh, Russian neuropsychologist, the youngest and most complex portion of the cortex. Wally Norda, another brilliant anatomist, Mr. Feynman. These are not dumb people. It was just hard to get the handle on what exactly this massively evolutionarily developed part of the human brain is doing. I think Luria came closest. This is Alexander Romanovich uh, Luria, I think the, the greatest the neuropsychologist ever. This book, The Working Brain, is truly a classic. And you can, in this book, based on his observations of people with frontal lobe damage, combined with some EEG work, uh, he made a lot of, he, he deduced a lot of things. The frontal lobes are essential for organizing the intellectual activity as a whole, including the programming of the intellectual activity, what are you going to do, and checking your performance, monitoring your behavior, and making any appropriate uh, adjustments. That's based on observation. And for those of you who work in this area, you know all those things are now becoming readily studied with neuroscience tools. And I think in part, one of the things that these patients lose is the most complex form of behavior. So you show this to somebody. So can you get, what do you see in this scene? Well, what's going on here? Um, a woman fell through the ice. Yeah. And people are concerned but afraid to do anything about it. Uh-huh. Except for this. Except for one, sure. So he put a story together. He put an abstract interpretation of this together, where the frontal lobe patient would do, say, someone fell through the ice, someone's laying on the ice, and there's people staring there. Right? They get the they get the elements they wouldn't get to the children. And that's that's hard to quantify. Right? Exactly. How do you quantify that? <coughs> so here's Ferrier. Instead of being actively interested in the surrounding, this is his monkey observations. They curiously prying into all that came within the field of their observation. They remain apathetic or doze off to sleep, responding only to the sensations or impressions of the moment. They have lost the faculty of attentive and intelligent observation. If you look at this patient with did this do something to my control here? What's happening? Is there something with this? No, I can't. It's got to be this. It's like the end lines or something. You know what it's doing? Got it? So this is a very severe bilateral stroke. It's a bilateral grasp reflex. Sure. Both hands. Hang. Let me just check some things here. I'm going to tap you. It's not going to hurt. I'm just going to give you a little tap. Can you? Okay. I think you can see there's a very prominent, say, four plus snout reflex. No clear, no clear rooting reflex. Open your eyes. Open your eyes, sir. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Try not to blink. If you look at this patient, and I'm not going to show you the data. Okay, open your jaw. Brain, open your jaw. So no brain. jaw jerk. I'm going to check him for a palma mental, which is an ipsilateral reflex. So there's where you're going to look. He doesn't have that. Okay, so we, that's just to set this. Conversely, if you look at orbital frontal damage, the inferior part of the brain, and here's a chronic lesion, these are the kind of cases that you're going to have in your in your cohort from the, the, the trauma surface. This is one of the principal remaining deficits is an orbital, orbital frontal damage. Uh, that's obviously an old, a, a post-mortem. 
This is actually the MRI scan of this particular gentleman here. And then like the lateral frontal patient, who you can see was like just the classic textbook description of a bullet. Like no interest, no motivation, no interaction with the world, stuck in set, perseverating, no change, no planning. This is a big orbital frontal lesion. Did you notice that you were attracted to a lot of women or just <laughs> not no, I, I, what was I was attracted. Very much so. To a lot of women. Yeah. Uh, I've touched things four times. Uh, put things in my mouth. Everything's an even number. All by fours, eights, or sixteens. Um, I count license plates. I count flags. You see he's Did you notice that you were attracted to a lot of women or just not attracted? What was I was attracted. Very much so. To a lot of women. Yeah. I touched things four times. I put things in my mouth. Everything's an even number. All by fours, eights, or sixteens. Um, I count license plates. I count flags. What's the problem that you're not what you thought you would be prior to the accident? Something uh, ha is impeding that. Obviously. I don't and have a whole lot of concentration. I uh, don't like being told what to do. I've had trouble maintaining a job ever since the accident. I am not that perceptive. I, I have. I'm naive. I can still take advantage of you on the streets. I believe people. No theory of mine. So you haven't had any fights. You haven't been arrested in the past 20 years. Oh yeah, many what, times. What for? Uh, uh, to, to, twice on assault against my wife. Although, like I said, I punched. I need to replace the door. The only thing that got beat up was the door. And uh, for using, improperly using somebody else's credit card. Mm -hmm. And. Okay, I want to open a checking account, bounce two grand in checks in a week. Was that the right thing to do? No, of course not. Any other arrests? I uh, had a DUI, two DUIs, and a reckless. One in Hawaii, one in Washington. Um, seems like there should have been more. Okay, so if you, this yeah, I patient, not. I saw it, had been turned down for SSI because he had a perfect neuropsych testing. Everything he just passes easily, but in the, the free field of light, he can't really function. Some people would refer to that behavior. Is there anybody in here psychology group of people? Like, 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 okay. What would you? What kind of psychological thing would you take to him if you were going to just pick a syndrome? Chaotic, impulsive, poor interpersonal relations. Antipersonal. It could be anti, anti uh, it could be an interpersonal social, uh, person social uh, this personality disorder. You could lump it into borderline personality disorder, and that's what they often get misdiagnosed as. But it's not a board. This is what happens to anybody in this room if you have extensive damage to that uh, part of your brain. And in terms of him being a sociopath, why is he not a sociopath? He does crazy things, does stupid things, gets into fights. Why is he not a sociopath? What did he say? That made him not a public subject. He realizes that what he's doing is wrong. Exactly. That's exactly it. And you'll see in the literature that some groups refer to these patients as acquired sociopaths. It's absolutely wrong. You just know it's wrong now. Because you know, the hair psychosociopathy scale, you can't have that understand. You don't believe you're doing anything wrong. So, anyway, now, so I was all excited young neurology guy in residency, getting started. So we did lots of studies and um, with patients with damage in these areas. And I'm not going to go through them. But this, these are later studies. You, again, using neurological patients. Some of these just confirming some of the earlier studies on the role of the front lateral frontal cortex, particularly in allocation of attention and responding to deviant events uh, in the environment. We were real excited. I was. I put in my first R01 in 1981. The pink sheets came back. You know what the pink sheets are? No, you do. What's a pink sheet? The description, that, like the summary statements. Of yeah, but with the scores. Why is it? Pink? Was this? I, I is think it used called to be pink sheets, sheets, or is it pink paper? Yeah, I think it used to be print. It used to be printed in pink. I don't it know. comes in pink paper. Mm -hmm. You get that lovely little your career is worthless. <laughs> It's really a nice thing for the government to do. You would understand. And congratulations on your faculty position. Thank you. 
and soccer did it for her. You know that? <laughs> no, I didn't know it. Yeah, right? No. Yep, that was the opening story. It was the 2014 uh, Brazil, Brazil World Cup uh, tragedy. <laughs> the emotion, understanding, and all you would be. And, and, and she switched her intro to I think if the guy's in a bar and his team's getting crushed and he was going to have a date. Yeah. He was in a bad mood. But you you know, well, down in Santa Barbara, you told me what, they liked your story, but you said one person said the only thing wrong with your story is. No guy would go on a first date to a bar when his World Cup was on. <laughs> so I'm recommending to you, because you, you're kind of a nice person, you need to hang out more with that person. <laughs> We're a little grounding. <laughs> okay. So anyway, we, I put in my grant, right? I'm going to give a little career. Do you mind if I got around with it? My first pink sheets. So exciting. <laughs> 1981, attention orientation, human prefrontal cortex grant submission. Proposals well designed in the preliminary data support the feasibility of the proposed experiments. However, the frontal lobe no longer performs frontal lobotomy, so the relevance of the proposed research to the NIH mission is not apparent. Reject. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not something you can respond to, other than you are the idiots, so that's not okay. So then I call the NIH home office to say, what should I do? This moron tells me, if you were my kid brother, I'd tell you to switch to electric <laughs> 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 Anyway, to the rescue, Kenny Heileman, a nurse a neurologist, nurse psychologist, he's retired now at Gainesville, who has done a lot of work on hemispatial I didn't know him from Adam. I just called him. I said, you know, Dr. Heilman, what do I do? He said, ah, they do all kinds of stupid stuff in the NIH. Just switch it to another study section. So I switched it to another study section, resubmitted it. It got funded for three years. The next year, it got a seven-year gap. It's, it's in its 35th year of funding. <laughs> the, the moral of the story is not that that worked. The moral of the story is, I think, just follow what you think you want to do. Because that's what the, that's going to be. If you don't, you're not going to have the fun, uh, I think, in your, in, in your careers. And now, of course, the frontal lobe. Then it was useless. Now it's, you know, old. So anyway, all right. <clears throat> so. Back to reality, again, <clears throat> you know this guy. And I think they went over all this, so you, you showed them all the depths and the grids, etc. and you talked about the Benke grids. Not really. Okay, so you know we have grids, we have depths, and then you can have these very fine electrodes that are stereotactically implanted that you can record from, from different deep brain structures. And sometimes at the end, some of the electrodes here, you can have a version where you splay out eight fine microwires, which means you can also do or try to do super view record. <clears throat> this slide is important because up until about 2000, most people felt there were no brain rhythms above 65 hertz in the human brain. Nathan Crone reported a case, one case that he, the epileptologist at Hopkins, one case of high frequency activity of phonemes, and I think it's centered at 100 or 110 hertz to phonemes in the temple plane, and that is, I think that was the seminal observation. And since then, it's exploded that, and with the realization that this high frequency band is very powerful at tracking human behavior, and it relates fairly strongly to underlying cortical activity. And let me show you just a little bit about that. If you read about high frequency band activity, which I'm going to show you a bunch of data on, um, you'll see that it, 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 the most common interpretation it is related to a single unit, underlying single unit activity. This is a study by, by Martin Lachinsky in um, Charlie Schroeder's lab where we have a, a joint grant together and they're doing, we're doing human and they're doing a monkey research. And this is one of their projects is what, what is the source of this high frequency band activity that you're all interested in here? And I won't go into much detail other than this, your standard laminar electrode goes through the cortex, three to four millimeters, and you can find sinks, and you can find where there's high frequency band, and you can also record multi-unit activity. So here's what you see here. 
In the intragranular level, you see a sink. In the intragranular level, you see high frequency band activity. But you also see high frequency band activity in the supergranular level. So there's actually two sources. And they look to be dissociable. Because if you look at the, the high frequency band here, and you and, and when, you, when you've got your probe in here, you're recording single units, you will see single units only in the depth. You don't see single units in the top, even though you see high frequency band activity super granular. So there's a second source, and remember your electrode's here. So your electrode doesn't know, you know what's, what, what's coming up. It's a combination of these two. And this one looks to be calcium uh, dependent dendritic spikes, because you can block it with the encyclopedia, which is your classic blocker. And it goes across modality, so I'll just go down to here. Again, laminar probe, A1, um, attack, multi-unit activity in the infragranular level, spiking in the infragranular level, but high, no, no multi-unit in the top, but uh, high frequency band activity. I'm just pointing this out to you that the, it's still, it's very powerful, there's a tracking behavior, but this also points out that it's even more interesting in what it may reflect in terms of the underlying corporal physiology. I think a lot has to be done, and I think will be done. The other thing you can do with this technique, we've just started. I don't want to say we are you know, very good at it. I think we're, 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 we're sorting our way through. This is kind of funny, sort of. There's a colleague who's here, and Yvonne Skellen, who's at uh, UC Irvine, and they've been kind of spearheading our uh, new recording of single unit activity. Arian also has data. I think Lisa has data. There's, um, Athena has data. But I think maybe it kind of, particularly, I think Yvonne has done a lot of work uh, on this. And you can see they can sort spikes, basically, from, and this is, is this one? I think this is not the campus. This is ACC? I don't remember. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can sort spikes, right? So that's, um, and, and they're all, you know, you're okay in terms of refractive. There's a lot of control. So that's, I don't know what it's going to amount to, but we can do it, and hopefully we'll get better at it. So I'm going to go through three things. And what I'm not going to do today, because there's really not enough time, is what I talked about yesterday, which was auditory processing and attempts to do a neuroprosthetic device, because that is this neuroengineering need. So this, if anybody's interested, we can talk about it offline. But I want to talk about high frequency band and how it actually tracks behavior. And we're, you know, it's reflecting this underlying, I'm going to say two component driving force that coherence selects networks, puts things in sync to transmit uh, information. Let me take this on because it looks cool when it turns around. B. And phase amplitude coupling, all the, the, the phase of an underlying slow potential determines when single unit activity and high frequency band activity is going to occur. It's a tuning property to tune areas, get them connected, and get them at a certain phase where they're more likely or it's easier for them to transmit the coin of the realm in terms of information transfer, which is spike models. Okay. So first, high frequency band activity. And first, for those of you who have, some people have probably seen these patients, but I, does, has everybody seen the patient with broken aphasia? Or not, yes or no? Has anybody not? Okay, let me just, just do it with 30 seconds. This is your classic output aphasia. You understand what the person's saying to you, you have trouble outputting your... Let's check your language out now. Can you tell me what happened when you had the stroke. Yeah, sitting left without starting to go. Do you remember, was it in the morning or the afternoon? TV. No, uh, TV. 11? Yeah. 11 in the, in the morning? Yeah. 11 in the morning. Okay, so he's understanding what I'm asking him, but he has a non fluent. Uh, output of speech, sometimes just single utterances, but he's trying to communicate the correct content. He knows the question. He's showing me it's 11 a.m. Uh, can you tell me where were you born? Uh, 63, 68. 63, 66. 
I see. Okay. Um, where were you born? What city? Uh, Wendland. Where? Okay, so Wendland. Get the field, right? Wendland. Linwood? No. Understands and he has Let's just try some simple problem. language then. What's this called? To be. A what? To be. It's to be. A to be. It's kind of a phonemic error for toothbrush. He certainly knows. Okay. You know, you can see here these patients typically have this damage in the peritonal region, but they're usually not just Broca's area, usually cortically that are much bigger. But there are receptive and language decoding areas and semantic analysis in the back of the temporal lobe are largely intact. They're not perfect, but they're largely intact. So theoretically, since they know what they want to say, if you could decode their imagined words that they want to say, you could actually develop a prosthetic device. So more about Broca's area. So if you ask a room full of physiologists, is Broca's area active when someone speaks? Well, it's people don't output speech when it's damaged, so probably true. Turns out probably not true on a couple bases. This is Nina Dromper, a colleague of mine who's a prominent uh, aphasia researcher, and that's actually Broca's brain she's holding. And there's an infarct. This is the original brain, and somehow she got the Anthropological Museum of Paris to release the brain to become an MR scanner. So that's actually the famous brain from 1861, patient tan. He could only say tan, tan, tan. And when she hung it in the scanner, oh, by the way, it looks pretty, pretty well preserved since 1861. You know what was kept in? 100% alcohol. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's good, but that's what the You can see, you know, here, this would be where Broca's area would be on the left side. Yes, that's in part. You can see it here. But in addition, if you notice, there's extensive subcortical infarction involving the insula and this big connecting fire for the artery fasciculus. And this is from Nina's cohort. This is 36 patients with persistent aphasia, just like the gentleman you just saw, overlap lesion. Again, the lesion doesn't center in Broca's area. It actually centers subcortically, as you can see right here. So that raised the question as to what was, what was Broca's area doing? And this was, I think, largely solved, or at least a big dent was made in this by the Dean Flinker. But before I do that, uh, I want to show you this, one of our first studies where we did, we took advantage of ECOG to try to track uh, processing during verb generation, a very standard uh, preoperative test used in fMRI for localization. It's really simple. You get the person uh, a noun, and they have to quickly say a verb that goes with it, ball, throw, etc. Very, very simple. When you do that study, uh, with fMRI, you do lay out a lot of the perisylvian language areas. You've got the superior temporal sulcus, part of the STG, part of the MTG, superior temporal plane, Broca's region, um, and then uh, motor cortex, because you have to speak, right? You have to respond. Uh, what you don't see here, interestingly, is much frontal activation, which is interesting because you have to maintain a rule and implement it. That's the way, and you'll see why that's probably true. And this is one of the things that I think imagers have to at least be aware of. What you're going to see is this task unfolds, a patient doing this. You're going to see the frontal lobe go down, be blue, and then it'll come back up. But it all happens in 1.3 seconds. So if you average it, for what you're doing to get the image to front the front the fMRI activation, it may not appear. It's just something to think about. So let's just look at the language evolving here. This is, and you can see onset, decode 200 milliseconds, down, up, do something to select the verb, send it to the motor strip, hits the airway, refire your auditory cortex. Now that whole thing unfolds. In, I, I, I'm stretched to two second, a uh, two second movement in 10 seconds. It actually unfolds in this patient in about 1.4 seconds. So again, boom, 200 milliseconds, you've got the meaning extracted, you're holding the rule, you're implementing the rule, you're driving, you sent the, 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 the motor code, and you then hear it. So pretty nice. Um, okay, we had a really hard time publishing this. We had the date in 2006. And we were rejected by multiple journals who told us that we should, why were we doing this and not doing fMRI? 
But I'm mellow now, so I don't really get bothered by that. <laughs> the only good news is to... The only good news is two of the reviewers for major journals, including Neuron and one other major journal, who were the editors who rejected the paper on the basis it didn't seem it was like a waste of time, have now switched most of their lives to integrate the recorders. So I was I was collecting the reviews and I was gonna publish a opinion piece. But then everybody when everybody was done, but then I realized if I did it and we were having getting new jobs, it wouldn't be good. So I decided to suppress my New Jersey to kill the shark. Just <laughs> sitting somewhere. But if you ever want to publish it, you can. So I think it being a really very simple but very powerful study. He's at NYU now. And like he had a couple tasks: one word repetition. You hear tree, you say tree, etc. Recording from various Curry Sylvian areas, you know, blue is auditory, green is brocas, and then red is motor. And I think you can see here the analytic amplitude that you guys have discussed, which is the average of maybe 20, 30, 40 trials. You can see a huge response in auditory regions, very typical, centered at about 110, 120 hertz. Broca's area actually comes on about 150 milliseconds after. And if you know, just when you start, start to speak, Guess what? Book is there to just shut off. It's not on. The activity is actually in nearby premotor cortex. This is kind of so during the actual act of speaking, focus area is not active. And you can see this on the single trial level, and this is why I really this sums up why I think the central cranial approach is powerful. This is seven subjects, but they're stacked. Each one of these is one trial of doing, let's say, a, rep, a, 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 a different word repetition. One trial. This is actually the articulation line. You can see this tree chunk of gyrus lines up quite nicely. Uh, but if you notice, during hearing, Broca's area is on. It's, it comes on more linked to the stimulus. It continues until you speak, and then it shuts off and the activities being done by the nearby premotor area. So Dean's view is this is, Broca's area should be, uh, should be viewed as a, as a, as a supplementary motor area. It's, part, it's putting together the program to put the phonemes together, but send them to the motor strip to speak. This is really important because of the fact that you see it at the single trial level, you can do within subject statistics, which I'm sure has been discussed here, and that really is unlike almost any other technique in human neuroscience. And also, because it's reliable at the single trial level, it's a perfect target for brain-machine interface. If you don't want to have a brain-machine interface, you need to have 30 trials, and then say, OK. You can do that. You can do a P3 speller, and you know you get five, six, seven, eight detections, and you get the letter T. You can select T. But this is potentially even, um, even more robust uh, for translational applications in addition to statistical. To me, it's just, take, let's say this is one, I'm just going to say that's one subject. It's not the reaction times for all spread here. But let's say that's one subject. That would be the statistics on whether STG is active would be no different than taking a monkey raster scan in 50 trials and doing the statistics on the raster scan and say, OK, that's significant in that monkey. And that's why you see monkey physiologists get really good papers published with two subjects because they can do within subject. And that's what you can do with this particular approach. It works for, you know, we said, well, that's pretty cool. So we did a study on working memory. Eddie Chang, who uh, looks still this young. I saw him yesterday. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> anyway, but he was a, a postdoc in the lab. Did a, a simple working memory study to see if then at this high frequency not just the language, but it's something else you don't know about. So they're just passively hearing phonemes, i.e., uh, oo, then the classic zero back, which whenever there's an oo, press the button. And then the much harder two back, which means press that button if and only if there was an oo two stimuli before. That's kind of a standard paradigm. And there's a rash of imaging work and other work and lesion work linking this to the lateral 
frontal cortex. Uh, and past difficulty with increasing frontal activation as the working memory load and the manipulation load uh, increases. So he found, and I think this was nice, it wasn't you know, earth shattering, but it, it basically uh, gave a nice view into how the ECOG could track known phenomena, as you might expect. Because there is a link that you probably all know between high frequency band activity and the bold response. They're pretty tightly coupled. So your bold blood flow is being driven by this high frequency response. So here's the zero back. And I'll try to stop it at the peak frontal activation. Oops. Anyway, you'll see the maximum, you're going to have to just remember this, it's not stopping properly. Watch how much is activated in the zero back in the front bowl. There's activation for sure, okay, no doubt. Motor, person is, you know, pressing the button, etc. Then we go on the other side to the two back, and I think you'll have to remember with, well, that's pretty close to the zero back, you're going to see a massive increase in front bowl activation. All the other areas stay the same. And that's just your classic load-dependent frontal lobe activation. So that was a kind of more reality check for us that this metric uh, made sense. Okay, so here, this is a use of the high frequency band response by Matar Haller, who was a PhD student in the lab, and then Dusta Shestio, who was a postdoc. Um, and they, did, they were interested in this classic perception action cycle that many people have written about and talked about uh, and how, when you're asked to do something, how do you keep the world in mind, and then how do you implement it, whether it's moving or speaking or whatever. They had eight tasks they did, ranging from very simple with very fast, tight reaction times, like visual categorization, uh, real simple, face gender, male, female, face emotion a little harder, word repetition a little harder, then auditory categorization harder, Self-referential, does this word refer to me? Um, uh, Self-referential uh, visual and antonym generation, which is the most variable and hardest of all. So they had, they had this nice reaction time spread across multiple tasks. And basically they had 30, 16 subjects, eight tasks, 38 ECOG recording sessions. Now, to be clear, not every subject did every task. Okay, so some subjects actually, some of the tasks only might have had three or four subjects in them. Some of them might have had seven or eight subjects in them. So not everybody, I don't want you to come away with that, that 16 subjects each did they test. That did not happen. So they had a lot of electrodes, you can see. These are just summed over their patients. And then we defined active electrodes as electrodes with over 100 milliseconds of continuous um, uh, high frequency band activity above the baseline. And that gave them, these are the electrodes that we focused on. It's a little bit arbitrary. We could have used 50. We might have had a different criteria for baseline. These are all, I would say, tweakable. But this is what we used. And the bottom line, they did a kind of a modified PCA analysis. And it came out pretty interesting. Not surprisingly, they, they, they extracted sensory electrodes for the auditory tasks visual electrodes for the visual cast that had a nice onset, the little gray spots are the offsets of where the stimulus ended, and you know, and then here's when the person actually responded. And over here you have response electrodes. So these are electrodes that came on in association with either the speaking or the movement. And they had a distribution uh, like this, basically. Mainly three motor and motor, but a couple even more frontal, maybe preparatory, uh, electrodes in the lateral from low. The most interesting electrodes, and this doesn't particularly project very well, are these electrodes that are on from the, the task construction to the response. And they, all these electrodes, and you can't quite see here, every one of them, all these sweeps are on right to the uh, action. And if you notice, these center really in the lateral from the cortex. So this, this is their idea. This was gluing together perception and action. 
the different electrodes on any different trial, let's say the sensory electrode, the sustained electrodes, the motor electrodes, they went up and what if they on one trial they would all go up together or not. So they were they were working as a network on a trial to trial uh, basis. That was nice. But the the both and so I think that was pretty pretty good. Um, you might have predicted it. The one thing that popped out of the data that t still bugs us to this day is that we found an effect. Here's the sustained activity, let's say, on a fast trial. There's our tape. Sustained activity on a fast trial in one of these frontal electrodes, OK? Sustained electrodes. This is the activity in a motor or pre-motor electrode in blue. There's the reaction time. You see this crossover point? The point of divergence, where they cross over predicts reaction time remarkably well. And I'll show you how remarkably in a minute. So here, now remember, these are not these are not by tasks. So this could be a really fast RT and an antonym task and a really slow RT and a gender identification. They're independent of the task. Then you can see what happens here, a little bit longer RT. There's the inflection point. There's the inflection point. There's the inflection point. And you say, how, how strongly does this inflection point predict the RT? And the answer is crazy, right? You look at this and you say, OK, I, I did something wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, but I don't think we did. Uh, you can see that this is you know, this is our square. The, 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 the regression is just, I've never seen anything like it. And we've tried to get rid of it, and we can't get rid of it. What we can't do, <laughs> or we haven't figured out yet, is what's going on here. There's something, there's got to be something. There's some handoff going on at saying go. Um, and we tried a lot of things. We're most recently, we're trying to do state space analysis, but we'll see. Anyway, that's nice. And you can see these are nice little plots. And I do think when you're presenting your data, it's if you can make movies, for people who are not familiar with what you're doing, it kind of helps them to visualize. So here's one of these. Um, subjects doing a word repetition task. And uh, you're going to hear, you're going to see auditory activated. You're going to see frontal come on. Because it's a very easy task, it'll be on a relatively short uh, period of time as the motor electrodes come on, and then the task is over. So let's just take a peek at that. Boom, boom, frontal, motor, over, done, OK? Here's a harder task, anthem generation, hot, cold, etc. Did I get the definition of anthem correct? It's the opposite, right? That's stuff. Too long a word to spell. So here's an anthem, and again, you'll see on. Frontal comes on right away, it stays on, stays on, stays on, stays on, hands off, motor executes. Really pretty, pretty interesting. So simple, but interesting, and lots of there's lots of information. And I'm sure we'll be analyzing this data set many times in many ways. So let's move away from just the high frequency tracking behavior. I hope I gave you kind of a you feel that it works. There's it tracks pretty much everything. Pick your pick your pick your task: motor, sensory, cognitive, etc. This is work by Ryan Penolty in the lab. And I think everybody, did you show them this movie? You, know, you guys all know what coherence is, but I, thought, I just like this movie because it was hard to make. This is three kids in a playground. And they're on their swing. And each one gets pushed at a different time. So let's say mom pushes this kid. We'll just kind of figure out his oscillatory pattern. And there we go. The second kid gets pushed by somebody, a dad, another mom. They're out of sync. Third kid, they're all out of sync. Okay. They're all out of sync, but the kids want to be in sync because they like to laugh at each you know, look, you know, they're looking back and forth and laughing and communicating. And what they will do, take them a second or, I uh, mean, a minute or two, they will become synchronous. Right? That's coherence on a playground level. It's the same thing your brain is doing, boom, in 100 milliseconds. Establishing networks to move information around. And what Ryan showed is a couple things. He showed that, and I think very important things, that coherence between brain areas was established in, in one pattern for auditory tasks, in another pattern for motor tasks. And the idea is this. 
this is uh, some of this has been around for a while. Part of it has been seen, uh, written up by more by Pascal Fries. The two brain areas, A and B, are in the same phase. There, it makes it easier for them to transmit single unit activity because the phase will determine the local cortical excitability. If they're out of phase, you have a problem. There's a lot of discussion in the psychiatric literature now that is hinting at the fact that abnormal oscillatory phenomena are at the base of a lot of psychiatric problems. For instance, hypersynchrony is, might be engaged in OCD. Poor synchrony, maybe thought disorders. I mean, these are big, open-ended things. But in any event, so that was important. And then more importantly, I think, is he showed that we knew in, in, in rodents that the phase of theta, the trough of theta, was the lowest, ex the highest excitability in the hippocampus. And as a rodent navigates, theta phase predicts spiking. Right? So you have phase spiking coherence. In this case, he showed in this human data that it was theta phase basically predicting or coupled to high frequency band activity. Phase, amplitude of high frequency band it was a rodent phase, amount of single unit spiking activity. So it was a big, I think a very important observation and it's been extended in several different ways. Now I just want to mention a couple more things about frontal lobe and memory. Um, this is some work by Lisa Johnson. And I don't want to go through the details of the paradigm because you you know it's just I mean, we don't have enough time to go into that depth and you can read the paper, it's got everything in it. She really did some very interesting what, where, when, simple working memory studies. She did it in two groups, patients with frontal lesions. I think she had 14 patients with lateral frontal infarctions. And what she showed, I think, is a very cool effect. And, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, but the bottom line is controls show two different oscillatory patterns with different phase legs. They had an alpha rhythm coming out of the um, posterior brain going anterior and a theta rhythm going from frontal lobe posterior. And what she found in the patients with the frontal strokes is you lost the theta band. The, the frontal lesion abolished it. Now, interestingly, their behavior didn't go to chance. And, but, and I think that's in part because you know, the literature says frontal lesions, you can't do working memory. It's not true. Controls in this test were about 98% accurate. Her frontal patients were 86 seven percent accurate. Statistically different, but not at chance. Again, this idea that everything's in one place of the brain, I would basically deposit that in the I'll go in the mail box. The old snail mail. So it never gets anywhere. She did the same thing in intracranial data and this just came out and she had a nice cohort of patients. I think this is ten subjects that I think all of them are SEG1 might be an orbital foam grid. The green are lateral, the blue are orbital, the uh, red are deck because you remember those electrodes typically go in and get the amygdala and the hippocampus. So we have MTL, prefrontal, and OFC. And again, when you look at this, you, see, you, you don't get the standard story that, oh, the frontal lobe comes on and controls working memory. It doesn't work like that. I'm not going to go into the details again. I just want to point out that she finds quite clearly that the MT, the, a prefrontal drive uh, to MTL controls what, where, and when equally. It's like the frontal lobe doesn't care so much what it is. It just wants to make the system work better. But then the MTL actually goes in the other direction. And the theta from there controls where, spatial, think about the hippocampus, greater than when, greater than what information. This is a pretty simple task. And just in this simple task, we see these different oscillatory dynamics. And you know, the, 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 the other thing to really realize is the hippocampus is not waiting for things to happen. It's actually involved in working memory, as we'll see in a minute, is actually involved in language. OK, so this is some work by Victoria Paya, who is now in Radford, uh, Radford University in, in nine, Say, give me the right pronunciation. <coughs> Rothbard University. S say it again. Rothbard. 
she's actually quite a direct colleague of mine, so I would say that she's in the Dulles Institute, but we, that, which is part of Rothbard University. But I always want to, I always ask that who pays her salary? I, it could very well be the hospital that's paying the salary. It's not so, Rothbard. Well, the, the hospital, hospital is also called Rothbard, so it's Rothbard University Medical Center. And the Donders, and, and, and the Dulles really, Dance Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> well, they have a spectacular group. They, I, I, I gave a talk there. My only problem was like the first day in like four months when the sun came out. And I got there and there was like people stretched everywhere on the grass. <laughs> <laughs> and there weren't a lot of people in the lecture, but I figured they, they looked pretty happy. So that was uh, anyway, she's extremely talented. She was in the lab for a few years. And you know, it turns out in the literature, you say, well, the hippocampus, that's a slave. It gets, it helps store anything. And so it, of course, stores verbal memory, helps store, not, it helps store verbal memory, words, etc. It's part of the, the, the memory component of language, but it's not really involved in language per se, like we're communicating online. So a group in Illinois showed in a couple of neuropsych papers that if you looked at patients with hippocampal damage, uh, and most of this is a stroke in the hippocampus, their patients were CA1 hypoxic damage, that they, they reported that the patients who looked normal on almost all standard aphasia batteries had problems extracting contextual information from ongoing speech. This is a pretty high level uh, capacity that is not really tested for in the standard aphasia um, uh, batteries. So she, she basically decided to test that with patients with implanted electrodes in the MTL like I've shown you before, and, there, and there's, it's pretty simple. There's constraint, contextually constrained sentences where you're targeting, at some point, only one word. So he locked the door with the, it's got to be key. There's a pre-picture uh, interval of 500 milliseconds. The key appears, and you basically press a button. It's correct or incorrect or whatever the choice is. And what you see in every, and then you have in another sentence, she walked in here with the, you know, that's unconstrained, could be anything. So the comparison is simple. Every subject gets faster, down is faster, reaction times when it's constrained. Um, so it's very robust. That's standard kind of, you know, that's been reported many times in the, in the behavioral literature. The interesting thing is that when you look at the hippocampus, and you look at the evolution of semantics, so he can't see without his, there's only one answer, glasses, as opposed to he can't play without his, could be lots of things, and you do a difference wave, what you find as the contextual information in the sentence evolves, usually by the third to the fourth word, you get robust hippocampal theta activity in every subject. So the hippocampus is actually involved in the online extraction of contextual information. I mean, this was completely unheard of. But that's the data, and now, of course, there's going to be follow-up studies. Um, I think, maybe, uh, did you talk? Yes? No, not yet, uh, but yeah. Okay. yeah. Maybe, okay. So, yeah. To, to look at what's the relationship between the MPL and the neocortex. You know, because we, the electrodes to get in there, they're going through SPS and uh, middle uh, frontal gyrus, so there could be a wealth of interesting network kinetics taking the hippocampus and seeing exactly how it's embedded in your classic, uh, classic pre-Sylvian language system. So another postdoc uh, in the lab, Anna Jopperpour, who's now at the University of Washington, she took a look, another look at this data set, and I really recommend people, when you've collected lots of data as your labs develop, don't be afraid to go back to it, because things change, methods change, techniques change, you're seeing the state of the art now, but you know, and you come back here in five years and it'll be it'll be tweaked. Something will be a little bit different. So she looked in this interval. Remember, uh, we sailed in a wooden boat. He looked at a wooden spoon. Could be, but could be anything. Could be a table, etc. Constrained. And there's the solution boat, press a button, and here you have this pre-picture interval. What's going on there? Is it just sit there and nothing happens? Turns out, no. What's happened is in the, in the high context sentence, and each one of these is an electrode, and this is the high frequency response, you get much more response before we showed that in theta. This is high frequency band in the hippocampus. The high 
versus low context. Okay, that's not so surprising, but it's happening in this window. Why is it happening in this window? All the processing is supposedly over. Well, guess what? It's not. You're actually setting up a preplay of the word that you think is going to come up. So if you do a similarity index between the high frequency band analog amplitude in the preplay interval, and when the, the object's actually presented, they, they can either look dissimilar or they can be highly similar. Right? So you calculate a similarity index, which you relate behaviorally to the reaction time, how fast they were. So you have another kind of behavioral regressor. And sure enough, you look at these electrodes, this is um, low context, wide open, and this pre-activation index is how much that activity in the delay period predicts your reaction time. It's a little bit better for a condition where maybe there's three or four or five possible words that fit the sentence, as opposed to you don't know what word it would be. But then if you look at the words that have a 90% likelihood of coming up because of the structure of the sentence and the linguistic database, what you see what happens is you get a massive uh, preplay. The pre in other words, the signal in the preplay, the high frequency band activity, let's say for the answer, which would be both, looks similar to when the both actually appears. You're constructing in your mind, before the stimulus appears, a mental image of what's about to happen. Prediction, preparation. It's really pretty, pretty nice um, finding. So, Whoops. <laughs> Not even close. Probably. 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 Probably having, let's say, a stroke and any special neglect. If the story Night Pass was developed by Leon Dayawell, who was actually then a postdoc in the lab and now a happily ex-chair of psychology at Hebrew University. As your careers progress and you get very excited about your director and chair positions, just remember one thing, no deed goes unpunched. All your friends will become your enemies. Actually, they won't become your enemies. Remember, when you become the chair or the director, you have resources. So you're no longer a person. You're kind of like a resource. Leon survived, though. So he's back to being just a goofy psychology professor. So the task is simple. An arrow comes up, and I'll show you running. So this side is cued, and if a blue dot comes up, you press a button. And if it comes up here, you don't. It's not you know just a standard Posner type cueing paradigm. And here you go, you can see it in action. So you could, there's a target, you press a button, you're allocating attention there, another trial, don't press, that's a non target set, and this goes on, you can come this collateral to the you know, degrees here, your attention could be here, it could be here on different files, could be arrow people. This is a nice example, this worked by Sarah Shapansky uh, when she was in the lab. Inner platyl sulcus, and this is going to be a little mentally not difficult, but here's the patient. They got a grid in their left hemisphere, they're looking at the screen. They could be attending to stimuli in that field, which would be going to this hemisphere where there's no grid, or they could be attending to the field contralateral to the grid. So non attend, attend. And what you can see, even in the non attend condition, there's a lot of high frequency band activity in the IPS. But as soon as you now switch the arrow and now say that you're attending to the other field, you get a remarkable increase in the high frequency band activity. This is exactly what you see in, in, in primate single unit studies, right? This is what you get IPS single units attention. So that's high frequency band activity. Interestingly, if you look at coherence, and you look at, again, same patient, and now they're paying attention to the left field, not to the side where the grid is. And you see this, this is the, the, the coherence arrow. You'll see anything that's in red is coherent with electrodes in its region. So these are all within frontal lobe coherent electrodes. 
the blue are all electrodes that are coherent in the prior lobe. Any electrode that's split in half means it actually has long range coherence between the two areas. So you have local and long range coherence. So that's what it's saying. It's not like it's not doing anything. Something's happening. And then you now switch so that the stimulus is in the right field and you can really pick up the activity in the left grid. And what you, I hope you've seen is most of these solids have turned to split. And that's because you've now massively increased your coherence between the two areas. And then if you just put the icing on the cake and you look at cross-frequency coupling, again, this is the right hemisphere grid case. You have cross-frequency coupling even in a non-dependent field. This would be the right field in this patient. And this is the, it's about three to four hertz coupling at 120 hertz, both frontal and parietal electrodes. And now you switch attention to the attended field and you get a massive increase. So that simple test shows you the power of high frequency band activity, coherence, cross frequency coupling. We're almost there. We won't stop. <laughs> this is okay. So uh, this, this is new stuff, so I kind of like to look at the slides because I've never seen them projected. So this is uh, Randall Helfrick. And you know, another big thing in attention is it's seamlessly flat. So if I'm going to pay attention to this field, is it continuous? Just stay steady over time. Or is there some rhythmic nature? And there's behavioral studies, I think from several labs. One is Sabine Kastner's lab and other labs showing that there may be a theta cycling of the amount of attention that you allocate to your visual field. It's, you think it's continuous, but maybe it's not. So Randolph addressed this uh, in a pretty nice study, um, which just came out. In a spatial cueing task, here's the trial. And then the cue, you get started. Here's the cue, the little box there. And then there's an interval from 500 to 1700 milliseconds. And then basically, a oh, you can't see it on here. You see that faint break? Maybe. Uh, a tar that would be the target. You know, if, if you press get th this correct, it came up here and you said yes, you're wrong. So you have correct and incorrect. Spatial cueing task. Here's some of the electrodes. The bottom line, is it linear or is it cycling? It turns out it's cycling. It's not like it's cycling 0 to 100. There's a definite cycling on the fine edge of your attention capacity. And you can see here in the individual subject, this is hit rate. It doesn't stay flat. It goes up and down at a theta cycle. And that's just the theta cycle in that single subject. But it's uh, there across at a group level. We actually did it in another separate econ data set. So we had two data sets. Um, we looked at it in um, the spatial cueing task, and then we went back again and basically looked at Sarah Chapansky's attention task and found the same effect. So we, again, we data mined her data set, combined it with this, and got the same effect. So that's kind of fun. Now, where, where, do we have anything for a minute? I forgot to respond to All right, just kind of. Give me. <laughs> no, really. What is it? Ten minutes? Five minutes? Seven, yeah, ten minutes is fine. Yeah. Ten minutes? Is that okay with everybody? You okay, because, yeah? All right, so hierarchical control, there's a lot of stuff written on this. The, what's the name, the Copeland in Paris is that interesting imaging. Mark Esposito's lab. Uh, we did a lesion study at Berkeley with David Batter. And the bottom line, first pass, motor, premotor, attention, working memory, higher level abstract will implementation. There's a, um, a coral rostral representation of the frontal lobe. And the question is, how do they all interact? Do they talk to each other? And if you do, if you do the, the study I'm going to show you, you find that the high frequency response, depending on the rule complexity, does just this. It changes with the uh, type of uh, trial task you're looking at. And Brad, uh, who's now at UCSD, he had simple tasks, simple reaction tasks. They got more complicated. They got so complicated that they kept telling them that nobody in their right mind would do the task. But somehow they, it actually worked in enough people. And the bottom line is the high frequency response track. So simple motor, M1 premotor, a little more complicated, middle frontal area 46. Most complicated uh, abstract rule complex 
uh, implementation, rostral, frontal, anterior 9, 46, uh, and 10. And that was okay, that's kind of tracked the fMRI, but I think the, the new thing that's added in this particular analysis is directional phase amplitude coupling. So I showed you evidence for local phase amplitude coupling. In one electrode, the phase determines the high frequency band. That's uh, interesting. And by the way, it predicted reaction time on that two attention tests ago. This is actually someone doing, let's say, a mid-level task, activating the middle frontal gyrus. It turns out there's directional phase amplitude coupling. What do I mean by that? The theta phase in the frontal lobe, here it is, actually drives high frequency band activity in the motor strip. So one part of the brain is telling another part to do something. So now you're not just talking about being tied together as a putative network and maybe the face slope index or something says one comes on before the other. You also have some evidence that, that in independent of co coherence metrics, you have prediction of some index of local neuronal activity, the high frequency band being driven from another brain area. Turns out this is this applies to all the studies that we've looked at, they're not a lot, but we're, they're more in progress. And this work by Jia Zhang, who's now a postdoc at MIT. She was in Jack Lin's lab at UC San Diego. And this is this idea of directional phase amplitude coupling in emotion. So you know, you know this is your standard. Amygdala, hippocampus, emotion, preference for fear, encoding, and more emotional stimulus is better encoded, you have better recall for it. That's been known. That's the von Restorff effect. You know, the von Restorff effect goes back to 1933. So how does it work, though, on a network level in humans? So she presented very simple landscape pictures, pretty neutral. Well, that looks a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> find a skull there or something. So landscape, and then really kind of emotional. You know, keeping the task simple makes it, means you're going to get a highly cooperative patient. Uh, and this one's as simple as it gets, you just look. So fear faces, pretty simple. The uh, GIA had um, electrodes in both hippocampi, and yellow was amygdala, green is hippocampus, <coughs> you can see the electrode localizations, and, I'm just going to show you this paper. This one I just impressed the neuron, which shows the relationship between amygdala and OFC. This is going to be the amygdala and hippocampus. And yes, only when you, when you do a comparison between fearful and landscape, you see that during fearful faces, the amygdala drives the hippocampus. The idea being it's extracted some fear signal, and it's now saying it's laying that down so that it's, it's providing input to the hippocampus to do whatever magic the hippocampus does. And you can see it both with directional phase amplitude coupling, amygdala drives the hippocampus, so there's theta phase, high frequency, it's in, each one of these is an individual subject. The reverse doesn't work. If you do Granger causality, amygdala in red drives the hippocampus. I shouldn't say drive, it's, yeah. It, it, it what? Granger causes is what you would say. Granger causes. Well, the Granger can't cause anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that doesn't work for me. <laughs> we'll work on it. Okay, and the hippocampus doesn't drive the Granger causes. Wow. Really happy. Okay, so now, yes. we have be happy. <laughs> that orbital frontal patient, you know, with poor decision making, and the role of the orbital frontal patient. In, in reward processing, it all many many things point to its uh, its involvement. In, uh, and what would you say? What would you say were the core behaviors that led you to do this study? So there's there's both lesion evidence and you know, a ton of um, monkey studies showing you know both when you have an OFC that's damaged, if you have people um, play games where you have, you have to make decisions and then suddenly they just become notoriously bad, right? So it's one way of capturing those kind of unorganized thinking, bad decisions. Uh, so that's one thing. And then people have examined the uh, computational properties of individual neurons in monkeys, which seem to track mathematical aspects of that. So 
we thought, you know, this yeah. makes sense. So this is a chance to say, the, the, this, uh, the, um, Ignacio reported the disruption that led him to focus on this area to see if you could get any of the real physiology and intact uh, OFC. And these, I think, nine out of 10 were grids. Were they all grids? All grids. All grids. Yeah. All worker farm grids. The task is super simple, but really a beautiful task. The uh, subject is pre uh, presented with this board. The number four is here. If the next number that comes up is above a four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, they get 30 bucks if they take that bet. If they decide not to take that bet, they get 10 bucks. Now, if they took it, and you might say, well, they don't want to take, maybe they won't take that bet because it's a four, and, uh, you know, it's kind of right at the margin of, you know, what you're going to do. Uh, but you still have more numbers that can come above it. So let's say you bet, you bet this one. And it comes up a six. Fantastic. You just won 30 bucks. However, let's say you bet this, you basically didn't bet this one, and you took the $10 bet. You got 10 bucks, and it came up a six. You won 10 bucks, but you didn't win 30. So you still have, you feel like you lost something, even though you got 10 bucks. And I'll show you what, uh, uh, what um, Ignacio, one of the things that we found out, and this is a standard curve you get. That's the patience, actually, and that looks like anybody, this is what the betting thing would be here. So the proportion of gambles, if the number that came up was a nine, should be about zero, right? Because there's only one other number that's going to beat it. Whereas if the number comes up as a two, you probably should gamble because you got a lot of numbers above. So it's a classic behavioral. Patients can do it, and I think the results are really fascinating. Um, there are, I'm not going to go into the, any of the details. Ignacio can, you can read the paper, he can talk to you about it. There's lots of electrodes in the OFC related to the processing and the decision of whether you're going to make the choice. I think that's kind of known in some ways from imaging. But I think the remarkable thing, first we can see the real-time kinetics of it in humans. And also, I will just mention, it's not modular like this here. There's not, these cell, these electrodes, these different response properties, I think it's fair to say they're distributed. There's no clear lateral medial organization in the OFC. So that is uh, the, the choice electrodes, but now you get the reveal. And so the reveal, let's say the reveal, when it was $4 and you said, I don't want to take a risk, I'll take the 10 bucks, the number comes back six. You have a little regret that you didn't bet. Uh, or you take the four, you, it's the number four, you take the $30 bet and the number's three, you lost everything, you also regret. Turns out, independent of whether you won, but not as much as you could get, or you lost, you get a regret signal in your orbital frontal cortex. A very robust regret signal. This is really interesting, because if you just think about it, forget about the data, forget about the implications, think about the implications for people with addictive behaviors and other behaviors. Maybe they don't have a regret signal. I think they're doing an EEG study now, right? Yeah, we have data already. Yeah, yeah data? Because if you did I isolate a regret signal in the scalp EEG, wow. You have something to look at in clinical populations and maybe even try to feedback control or brain stimulate control, etc. So that's pretty cool. Here it is unfolding. This regret signal in the OFC. Cool. All these electrodes, lateral, medial, both sides. Okay. So real quick, let me just say. Okay. I'm sorry, Arian. I can't talk about anything. We catch you more time. Okay. Yeah, but this is, I think this is one of the most coolest things we've started to do in the lab. Our volume was going up at UC Irvine, and we had it with one, it's usually one patient at a time, and we had two patients. And the team figured out how to wire up two, two computers so that they could play Aryan's nonverbal social, social communication game. So just think about this. We have two patients with intracranial electrodes in two separate rooms trying to communicate nonverbally over a computer. Uh, pretty amazing. And there's other work going on that, that, that um, Anise could tell you about, because she's developed a task to look at 
this two-person communication and a little bit more linguistic task. And the task that we've got to, we've got to get the gambling test set up because poker is a natural for this. People like you know, you get two people on to play poker. Can you imagine? What? The patients like it. Don't worry. They're not connected, by the way. We're not. This, this juice is not from their electrons. <laughs> Just to be clear, it's, 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 it's a little. Okay, real quick, we've done a lot of sleep stuff, and we're going to be doing more because we now are set up to do it and record overnight sleep in the epilepsy patients and in regular scalp cases. And I'm not going to go into this, but you know. In a nutshell, we know that slow oscillations, cortical spindles, and ripples are key to memory and to memory overnight, key to sleep. Restful sleep, more slow waves, more spindles, these three in concert, better overnight retention. And that's been known. There's wonderful stuff published by all kinds of basic science people. This is a quick uh, little finding from Randolph. We have this in intracranial, but I'm just going to show you the first paper, which was just scalp EEG. So what good is scalp EEG? I think it's good for lots of things. Basically, this is extracted slow waves in young adults, and this is extracted spindles and in, in overnight sleep. And we have an automatic algorithm for that. You can see across the population subjects, the spindle hits on the zero point of the slow wave. Okay. And they have pretty good overnight retention. And if you look at older adults, this becomes uncoupled. So that the spindle does not occur on the peak. It's off the peak. And the farther the coupling is off this zero peak metric, the worse the overnight memory is. And we have a paper now kicking around in review, or it should say being kicked around in review. Uh, this slow wave spindle coupling in Alzheimer patients and frontal temporal dementia patients. And there's some evidence that you actually are showing abnormalities in coupling in people who are preclinical, which is the PET scan that says they have amyloid. And they actually have deficits in this. So that's another whole, that's some work with um, Matt Walker and, uh, and his lab. But that opens up a whole new potential uh, clinical uh, interface. And then the final slide is Jana Lender, anesthesiology resident. I was taught, most people were taught, you were taught, that level of arousal is best tracked by slow wave sleep, right? Slow wave sleep years, yeah. Uh, but it's by slow wave oscillations. You had a cardiac arrest, slow waves on the EEG. Your cortex is suppressed, that's what predicts your sleep, etc. There's a problem with that. It's been staring people in the face forever. And that problem is during REM sleep, you actually have a drop in slow wave activity. It drops. This is your slow wave activity in non-REM sleep, and it drops during REM sleep. So basically, slow wave activity, even though you're not awake, you're not aroused, slow waves don't track all forms of arousal because they don't track REM sleep. So this is the 1 over F power spectrum here. And we've done some work on this in older subjects, and some work by Brad. And basically, this is Yana's work, where she has the power spectrum in the awake state. And then if you notice, the power spectral slope drops, becomes more negative in both non-REM and REM sleep. And, and the idea is you're getting a more inhibited uh, pattern in your cortex. And this metric, this 1 over F slope, precisely tracks REM. Boom. That's the one over F. You got more negative as it went, it went down, but REM, 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 REM. So this is pretty nice. Uh, beginning work um, in review, uh, but I think it just shows you there's a lot to be looked at in sleep, and there's a lot to be looked at in what's happening in overlight sleep, what's happening in coding, and so on. So thank you for um, your attention. You now know about JAWS, and those are some of the people. And thank you guys for doing this. I hope it goes on.
until you get so sick of doing it, you say, do we have to do it? <laughs> Which may happen. <laughs> Any questions? Give the complaints to Colin over there. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment. Um, so one of the things that um, that I think is very obvious from Bob's talk is, well, it has two aspects to it. One is the wide array of behaviors that that, that he's examined, right, yeah. over his career. Everything from sensory perception to uh, high decision making, interpersonal communication, um, you name it. it. It's all there. But perhaps most importantly, in the context of the of the field trip uh, boot camp is, you've seen how every single one of those questions comes with a different analytical strategy. I mean, we've seen all sorts of things, right? From low frequencies to high frequencies to coherence to directional coupling to, you know, the one over F profile. Everything was an analyzed using a, a different analytical strategy that, that, that was adequate for the, uh, for the problem at hand. And I think that's, that's, that's first, very elegant, but of course, you know, there's there's no one size fits all solution for these sorts of problems. Uh, you can have to figure out exactly what works for you. Uh, but you know, of course, you know, some beautiful work and phenomenal insights that you couldn't have otherwise. Yeah, you can challenge, you can test old dogma that's not true. You can get new insights into things that have not been defined. I think your point is really really key. And but I will say, what you begin to see over many many tasks, some. Um, beginning to emerge fundamental principles about brain organization, information transfer, um, et cetera. We do things fast, and the only way you're going to do it fast is with electrophysiology, and the only way you're going to do it really fast is with, I think, in my view, a lot of parallel processing. There's obviously sequential flow, but there's a lot of information going back very rapidly in, in, in short time windows between brain areas. Good? Peace and love.